Hello, this is Wendy from Stormy Wind. Today, I'd like to introduce to you a book that my husband found on the side of the road in a box. It's called Lest Ye Faint. It's written by S. Franklin Logsdon. A souvenir volume for mo members and friends of Central Baptist Church, London, Ontario. Pastor S. Franklin Longston. Pastors may come and pastors may go, but of one only can it be said, Thou remainest. Hebrews 1.11 In honor In the heart of Forest City, with its lovely verdure green stands a meeting place for Christians in its whiteness so serene emblem of its faithful message white the righteousness of saints light for those in sinful darkness courage for the one who faints. In the soul of all its people burns a zeal deep and true for the one above all glorious, his blessed holy will to do. In fellowship so precious, in an atmosphere sublime, with a token of God's presence, there is blessing all the time. Like the ointment of the priesthood as it flowed to Aaron's feet, in the fragrance of such sweetness, so in unity they meet, gathering in the name so worthy waiting on the one unseen. Heaven oft has dipped so near them that there seemed no space between. And the rays of light shine outward to the lands beyond the sea where it cherished <clears throat> sons and daughters. Witness there so faithfully God 
be praised for all his kindness to the people of his fold. May his gracious loving favor be their constant joy untold. S.F.L. Affectionately inscribed to Dr. E. Ralph Hooper, Dean of London Bible Institute, <clears throat> a vessel unto honor and mightily used of God as medical man, missionary, teacher, writer, and counselor. His uncompromising stand for the reveled truth of God's word, his energetic spirit, spirit, and ever gracious attitude have been a spiritual stimulant to countless numbers and to the author. Hello, I'm back again. Consider him that endured such 
contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint. Forward by William L. Pettingill, D.D., pastor of the First Baptist Church in the city of New York. Here is an unusual book by an unusual writer. Here the reader will find a veritable wellspring of joyous refreshing. Pastor Longston, as this book clearly reveals, has diligently studied to show himself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As a result, according to the grace of God which is given unto him, he has become a wise master builder, and his skill is revealed in these studies. There is a sense in which there is nothing new that is true, as another has said, If it is new, it isn't true, and if it is true, it isn't new. But there is a new way of presenting old truth, and our author has found the way. Here the reader will find no hack-eyed phrases, no threadbare platitudes. The truth is here, but in a new garb. The food is the good old bread of God, and it is served in plain dishes. The reader will be benefited as he scans these pages, and he will be delighted as well. For many years I have known and loved Franklin Logston and esteemed him as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It is a pleasure to commend this latest of his writings to God's people everywhere. Keep looking up, my soul, my son. W. L. Pettengill Introduction Decadent days call for challenge. This is the major theme of the Minor Prophets and the point of emphasis in the Second Epistles. God's people so readily lapse into complacency of such alarming proportions that all heaven seems to become solemnly disturbed. O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Such were the intermittent surges from the heart of God in Old Testament days, nor were conditions much more gratifying in the new it is high time to awake out of sleep, warned the Apostle Paul. His colleague also found it necessary to arouse the hearts of the drowsy, careless believers with a challenge to renewed zeal. I stir up fully, I stir up awaken fully your pure minds, Peter commented, and then added, What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? In the sad period when the Lord was forced through Israel's disobedience to withdraw his Shekinah glory from them, it was with extreme reluctance. The withdrawal was effected slowly from the Holy of Holies to the threshold to the east gate, to the east side of the mountain, thence to be seen no more until the last prophet of the legal period said of Jesus. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, in the midst of the departure of God's glory. In ancient times, the sad necessity was expressed. I will take the stony heart. I will give them a heart of flesh. God desires a heart response to his blessed and faithful entreaties. But his people today, as of old, have stony hearts. Christians are unquestionably deficient in the realm of deep, settled convictions. Standing by one's convictions means to maintain an uncompromising attitude 
with regard to that which is divinely approved. It is a firm refusal to deviate from the paths of or orthodoxy. It is an avowed adherence to the principles and precepts of God's revealed word. It is that kind of spiritual stama stamina which is able to withstand vicious attacks. It is a definite stal stalwartness of character which remains unaffected in the midst of the detracting influences. It is this, that strength of soul, which shows no tendency toward surrender. It is a determination to press on when others are dropping by the wayside. It is a devotion that maintains its warmth when the temperature round about us is dropping. It is a vision which continues to focus upon the goal. It is a steadfastness which survives the current epidemic of indifference. It is purpose in its faithful display of resoluteness. Many of the personalities of the scriptures are identified by one particular characteristic. Meekness reminds us of Moses, patience of Job, weeping of Jeremiah, doubting of Thomas, impetuosity of Peter, while purpose is ever associated with Daniel. But every true servant of God must, of necessity, be a person of purpose. The command and the Lord requires it, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Purpose makes for dependability, consistency, dedication, and accomplishment. Purpose allows no room for indecision, listlessness, and uncertainty. Purpose is to the servant of God what the sense of direction is to the homing pigeon. It develops a desire for obedience to the divine commands and encourages a determination to fulfill his blessed will. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young man, men utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and still walk and not faint. Well, this is going to be the... Introduction. We're just finishing that up. And the contents has 13 different chapters. And so the next video that I show you uh, will be of that. The contents, the first chapter is called The Complete Breakdown of Faith. The complete breakdown of faith, carest thou not that we perish, Mark 4.38. The weird cries of the coyote in the prairie wilds are rivaled only by the mingled me moans of despairing hearts in the darkness of adversity. Down, 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 the declivities of a chasm of grief, disappointment, or pain, goes the sinking soul, which has, at least for the time, lost its grip upon the anchorage of faith. If the question were asked, Why art thou ca cast down, O my soul? The plunge of our spirits downward would, be once, would, would at once be broken. There is no legitimate reason for the disintegration of inward fortitude when our blessed Lord is a present help in trouble and when his sustaining grace is amply sufficient for our every requirement. Hope thou in God will prove for us as well as for David 
of old, a profitable prescription, the practical point of importance in the hour of adversity is to turn our eyes from the tempest to the one who is mighty to deliver. The varied experiences of the disciples are rich in the information and encouragement for us. We follow them to maintain heights across the plains and over the waters in the company of their Lord and ours. The discerning eye of the students of Scripture must be alert to observe how, at points, as the mother eagle is said to push her young birds from the nest to exercise their wings, the master sought to strengthen their pinions of faith. The fearful storms, sudden and unexpected, the hungry thr throngs, and no bread, the long hours of toil and no catch. These and many like experiences were designed to strengthen the sinews of faith and to produce stalwarts for conquests in after, your, after years. But now let us witness how the master met a maritime menace and how the fever of fear was overcome by the great physician. The sudden storm. It was evening and the lengthening shadows were being retarded by the delaying action of the fading rays in the afterglow of the setting sun. Let us pass over unto the other side, advised the master, following a day of instruction and counsel, obedient to his word. The disciples launched out on what was to prove a most eventful voyage, so symbolical of life as you and I meet it with its inevitable vicissitudes. And we must not overlook a delightful suggestion found in the words. And they took him, even as he was, how ill content are so many in our day to take him as he is. So many will not take him as the divine Son of God. Others will not take him as the one who alone is able to save. Still others will not take him as the one at whose right hand are pleasures for evermore. Oh, do take him as the satisfying, sustaining, all-supplying Savior and Lord in whom you are complete. The Contrary Wind There arose a great storm of wind, the very terminology of the inspired record leads us to the conclusion that this was not an ordinary tempest. But how subtle is the wind! Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. They felt the gentle stir of an animated atmosphere against their weather-beaten cheeks. They saw the slight ripple of the earnest while still waters in the lessening light of a fading day. And then the white caps began to appear to multiply as myriads of miniature fairies dancing upon the watery surface as though not content with child play. The wind in a sterner display whipped the white caps into frenzied dashing waves growing by the moment in size and turbulence, attacking and tossing the boat of disciples, even as a professional wrestler tries to overpower his opponent. It was a great storm. The reader will call the mind that contrary winds is a term aptly chosen by the Holy Spirit to symbolize false doctrine, the dissemination of which is just as subtle as the wind which blows. It causes a little ripple in the peaceful confidence of the soul without too much notice of cons or concern at first, 
and then the white caps of a growing instability begin to manifest themselves. They are warning signals of a dangerous course in the life. If not corrected, they will inevitably eventuate in the waves of a restless attitude toward the clear and concise precepts of divine revelation. Then the testimony capsizes in the waves of evident dissatisfaction with the way of the Lord, and one's faith suffers shipwreck. Of course, winds will blow, but the Christian sailor's ever faithful fi pilot says, let us pass over unto the other side. He knew the storm would rage, but it is clear that he intended them to reach the haven safely. The confronting waves, this was a real experience. It has all the elements of vivid drama, but it was real. They were well out from the point of embarkation, but still not in sight of the port of entry, and they were in the midst of the great storm. The wind, though strong enough to blow them off their course, was not the chief concern. It was the waves which filled them with terror. High, horrible, hard-striking waves which beat relentlessly against their little craft. Defensive measures were the only move of which these experienced sailors were capable, and even their collective effort was hopeless, ho hopelessly weak in the midst of such powerful billows. As, as the contrary winds are symbolic of false doctrine, so the waves are indicative, indicative of troubles. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me, the palmist lamented. These may have been high waves and rough billows, but they had not all gone over him. This is just a common illusion in the soul of the one going through deep waters of sickness, sorrow, or disappointment. We become so occupied with our own cases that we are prone to forget that others are in desperate straits as well. What caused the boisterous waves? The wind, of course, and it is the contrary wind of false doctrine which accounts for the rough sailing for so many. One who is built up in that most holy faith through the pure truth of God's word will meet turbulent waters from time to time. But such, an, such a one has the comfort and con confidence of the captain within his bark who furnishes grace and strength for the trials being met, nor are life's most grievous problems those of sickness or affliction. The hottest tears shed and the most distressful emotions experienced have been displayed by those who have erred from the way of righteousness and had fallen into shame and reproach. Their crafts were blown off the charted course by the contrary winds of doctrine, and the waves of bitterness, grief, and remorse were but the disillusioning results. To reach the other side with the Lord necessitates a sweet and willing concurrence of our hearts with his holy desires. Spikes, spikes, spikes of fire. 
When relieved from the rain 